Thank you for all coming out today on this sunny afternoon. And um, for many of you, it is your first time to this museum. So welcome and thank you for coming again. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our board sponsor today, Mr. Tom Izu. He is an advisory board member here at the museum. And he is also the, the executive director of the California History Center for De Anza College. And also he is the project director for the Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander Serving Institutions U.S. Department of Education grant funded program at De Anza College, sorry, called Impact AAPI. Okay. Mr. Tommy Zhu. Thank you, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Japanese American Museum of San Jose for putting on this program. And the museum, um, hopefully you get a chance to see the exhibit area if you haven't yet. But its main purpose is to promote and share the history of Japanese American culture uh, as, as well as art. Um, and it also has an education program where it works with local schools and teachers, sponsors events like this one. So if you could, if when you have a chance after the event, you could take a look at the literature about the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, see the exhibits. And I'm also told I should say this, is that it's totally sponsored, supported by volunteer labor. We don't have any staff here. So that means you want to make a contribution, you know somebody who wants to make a contribution, tell them to come our way. And there's some board members here. Aggie's here, Aggie Yamamoto, you're the you're the big poncho here. So as an advisory board member, I have the privilege of coming up with ideas for possible presentations and programs for the museum. And one area I've always been really interested in is the showing the connection between our community, the Japanese American community, and other ethnic communities and their history. Even though the museum's main purpose is to talk about Japanese American culture and history in this area, I feel that you can't really know that unless you also know the connection that this Japanese American community has with other groups, especially Asian American groups, because there's some very, very key ones. Um, and in fact, one of the things I'm very aware of is this very space you're occupying here, the land you're on, we call Japantown. A lot of other people have lived here and made this their community. Um, if you were fortunate, uh, I hope you were, uh, some of you saw the exhibit the museum sponsored really recently. It was about the Heinlein Chinatown. And if you know Heinlein, Heinleinville Chinatown, if you know anything about that, that was built about 1887. I think it's considered to be the third Chinatown in San Jose after the main one, which is in the Fairmont Hotel downtown San Jose, was burned down in an arson you know, fire caused by an arsonist. Um, so that the Chinatown was built here, which before Japantown existed. And I think pretty clearly most people see that as how Japanese American community um, Japanese American immigrants, when they first came here, they, they were attracted to the Chinatown area because it's one of the only areas they could settle and to literally set up shop and start businesses. And as more Japanese Americans came, it became their community too. Um, Connie Youngyu, who's a local historian, and she's not here, so she can't tell, say I'm misquoting her or anything, so I can, I'll just make up this, because I think it sounds good. <laughs> she said, she uh, was a curator for the exhibit, and she said that she feels that the Heinleinville, Chinatown, and Japantown area is one of the first Asian American communities in the true sense of that term in the mainland. And what he meant by what she meant by that is these different Asian groups actually lived next to each other. They had work, they had businesses and they did business together and they developed personal relationships as well. And I thought about that and I think of other communities, and it's true that there actually were Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans living together for a time period. The other thing though that I realized is there's another very significant community which has not had the attention I think it really deserves, and that's the Filipino-American community. They also were part of this history, even as Japantown was just barely developing, and as Chinatown was slowly kind of going on its decline, they were here in a very active community. So I thought it would be really good to start a conversation about that. And we're very fortunate to have some really interesting presenters right here in our area. And um, my hope is, that this will start some more discussion among people in this community, possibility of our the museum working with the Filipino American National Historical Society, which we'll talk about a little bit later, to continue doing research and continue to capture the stories of Filipino Americans and their relation with the Japanese Americans. So without further ado, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce Ron. Right? <laughs> Jimmy Yamanichi is kind of the 
He's many things some of you in the Japanese American community know, but one of the things, he's kind of like the infrastructure of the whole community here. So anything to organize and keep the social as well as the physical structure of this community going. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to introduce Ron Murrieta. He has many titles. Um, there's a lot of things they call you, but I won't share them. So <laughs> They're all good. <laughs> he is the uh, administrator of the Filipino American National Historical Society, or FONS, Santa Clara Valley, Santa Clara Valley chapter. And they just moved into the neighborhood down in the Eastern Memorial Building. That's where his office is. So he was very interested in continuing the discussion about doing projects together with the museum. He's also a trustee of the Northern California FONS National organization, right? Yeah, the National Board. National Board, okay. And, and Ron uh, agreed to facilitate um, facilitate this uh, panel for us, and he's going to do zero panel. Great, thank you. Tom Yuzu, ladies and gentlemen, give him. One of the things I, also, I do in, in my life is I'm also an MC. That's why I'd like to always acknowledge the, the opening uh, speaker. Um, I just want to start by saying it's it's an extreme pleasure and honor uh, to be involved in this first ever event, which I hope there will be other events that will uh, culminate from uh, from this uh, joint effort. Um, as Thomas said, uh, I am with the Filipino American National Historical Society. I want to give you a brief background about uh, the organization, and then I will introduce our uh, panelists here who will cover some really uh, key aspects of Filipino American history here in, in San Jose, Japantown. How many people have heard about the Filipino American National Historical Society? Raise your hands. Oh, great. So we, we have a lot of folks here. How many people are members of the Filipino American National Historical Society? Only, we only have two. So that means that we're going to have a lot more folks who are going to join FONS uh, after this presentation. Thank you for being FONS members. Uh, FONS uh, is a, a grassroots historical organization that was established in 1982. Uh, by doctors Fred and Dorothy Cordova, uh, husband and wife, who reside in Se Seattle, Washington. We lovingly call them Uncle Fred and Auntie Dorothy. And uh, in 1982, they saw that there was a dearth of books, resources, materials that basically share the Filipino-American experience here in the United States. Um, so they started to work towards gathering all types of documents, photographs, materials, audio tapes, to ensure that the Filipino-American voice and history here in the United States would be preserved, documented, and then disseminated uh, through our various chapters and other uh, institutions throughout the United States. So FONS Nationwide has 30 chapters. Santa Clara Valley is number eight. So we are proud to be a part of the top 10 uh, chapters in one of the older chapters. So the mission is, as I had mentioned, is to preserve, document, and disseminate the historical contributions of Filipino Americans in the United States. Uh, as a way to institutionalize uh, Filipino American history, in 1992, uh, the FONS National Board of Trustees established Filipino American History Month. And we've been correcting a lot of people. It's not heritage. Heritage is completely different from history because in history, we were actively participating in creating history, whereas heritage is, of course, part of the culture and the fabric of what uh, you are a part of in terms of your community. Uh, so Filipino American History Month was established in 1992. And since then, we have been making efforts to institu institutionalize Filipino American History Month, which is October. So this month is Filipino American History Month. Uh, and as a way to ensure that folks know about the stories of Filipino Americans nationwide. Uh, we are at our 426th anniversary of Filipinos in America. And the reason why it's October is because on October 18, 1587, the first Filipino or Filipinos stepped foot on the continental United States, which is uh, what is known as uh, Moro Bay. Uh, they were part of the Spanish, Spanish galleon, and the, the Filipinos were referred to as Luzonas Indios, uh, which of course were the indigenous uh, folks from Luzon, because many Filipinos uh, were uh, the indentured servants of uh, the Spaniards on, and the Portuguese on the, uh, on the galleons. So that is why it's significant in October for Filipino American history, because our presence has been 426 years. And of course, it wouldn't be later on until the 1700s when Filipino Americans would establish formally uh, a uh, community in, of all locations, Louisiana, 
So uh, Filipinos intermixed with the uh, Cajun population there, and there are many generations there to this day. So we're really excited because we are now, that's the national perspective. We're going to be focusing here historically on Filipino Americans in San Jose. And I'm just really happy to have these. They're, they're not only um, colleagues, but they're very close friends. Um, and, and for me, mentors, because as someone who's involved in history, these folks have just such an immense um, wealth of knowledge and information that uh, we're imparting to, to my generation and other generations. Um, so I'm really happy to be on this panel with them. Um, we're going to start off uh, with our first panelist, but I'll introduce both panelists uh, at the same time. Our, our first presenter is going to be uh, Mr. Robert Ragsack, Sr. Is that correct? You're not junior, you're senior. Yeah, senior. Okay. Uh, and Robert is first generation Filipino American of uh, Filipino parents who, who migrated here to California in 1927. Uh, he's born and raised in the Chinatown, Japantown area, right here, uh, and uh, from the 1930s to the 50s. Uh, he's a retired space systems engineer. So he can't tell you anything about what he did previously because uh, it's all top secret. <laughs> <laughs> He's currently active in capturing the story and the history of the first wave of Filipino immigrants of the 1920s and 1930s who settled here in our city of San Jose. So Robert will be our first presenter. Our second presenter, uh, following Robert, will be Dr. Estella Habal. And Dr. Habal is an associate professor at San Jose State University in the Asian American Studies program. Um, you know, she received her doctorate at UC Davis in the history department. Uh, she published the, uh, a book called San Francisco's International Hotel, mobilizing the Filipino American community in the anti-eviction movement in 2007, which has been an essential text. If you're taking Filipino American history and, and studies, it's one of the textbooks that is utilized in terms of uh, um, the history of urbanization and the uh, removal, forcible removal of uh, not just Filipino Americans, but just uh, of the older populations who were uh, residents of the International Hotel. She has published many articles and presented talks on the history of Filipinos in San Francisco, uh, the participation of Filipino Americans in the 2008 presidential election, the history of Filipino Masonic lodges, the role of Filipinos in agricultural labor organizing, and particularly in the formation of the United Farm Workers Movement. Uh, She's taught Asian American Studies courses since 1999 in the Filipino American Experience, Asian American Women, and among others. Uh, she's very active in bringing young people, her students, and the community together, serving on uh, the advisory board of the Manilatown Heritage Foundation and helping guide the Filipino Memorial Project here in Santa Clara County to honor the legacy of the Filipino community. So Dr. Habal will be our second presenter. But right now, I would like to uh, turn it over to Robert who's going to show you a very visually stunning presentation. Visually <laughs> stunning. It is. I, I, li I like it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lover of history. So uh, I think you'll, you'll find this very, uh, very interesting. OK, and Robert? Oh, yeah. we'll, we'll make sure that we're not blocking the screen. Do I need it? Not to you. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay. All you senior Filipino Americans in the back, can you hear me? Okay. But if I if I start fading, uh, let me know and I'll be with you. Maybe a remote mic. What I'm going to try to do today is to show you there was a close connection between us, the first wave of Filipinos, which would be equivalent to the Issei, in the uh, Japanese immigrants. I think the Issei is Mike. Oh, for you too? Okay. I think he's like, please, please use the mic. Or is it the microphone now? Is there one? No, no, no the, the, mo the mobile mic. Yeah. Uh, turn it on. Is the switch on it? Okay, how this? Okay, but good. Loud and clear, five by five? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and so the Chinatown that I'm talking about, that I grew up in, and my sisters and brothers, and the rest of our friends who are the uh, second wave, so, you know, there's the, uh, what we call the Chinatown, which ultimately became Japantown, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that. And this was during the 1930s and 40s when uh, most of us were uh, first born at that time. And we experienced uh, the Chinatown that we knew then between 4th, 5th, and 6th, and Jackson and 
and tailoring. Well, a lot of the material I'll be presenting is from memories and a few from documents, so I'm going to put up a standard disclaimer, <laughs> but from the contribution of these people here. And um, I think except for Corky and Ralph and Kurt, Lily and Francis, they're here. Uh, Carlos Arevalo came and left. Uh, now, the Arevalo family is important, I'll talk to, to you a little bit more about that later. Oops. Yeah. Well, our friendship was formed very early. Here's a picture of a Peter Burnett Junior High School, 19, class of 1947. And I wanted to show you this because of the ethnic mix. There's uh, the Fort Nisa, you can see Ray Matsunaga. Any Matsunaga families here? I guess not. Uh, there's Eileen Fukumura. There's Ed Kimura, my good friend from elementary school all the way up to uh, high school. There's Ben Yoshihara. Uh, I didn't know that Beaver's first name was Konami until he graduated from high school. But Beaver was, I don't know if any of you remember, uh, he was a basketball player at Sansei High. He was a really, really great guy. And there's, here's Harry uh, Nakamura. But there was a, uh, the, our neighbor uh, when we lived on uh, 6th Street was Joan Kong, the Chinese. Um, there's um, Salvary Essie, the Italian. He lived on 611 North 4th, right in the middle of the Japantown area. And uh, here's uh, Willie Boyd, um, um, the black girl there, a good friend all the way through high school. And um, there's only two Filipinos in here, Ray Rivers and this smart looking guy here. <laughs> <laughs> well, right through high school, we formed really good, strong friendships, in fact, uh, through athletics. Uh, in this particular case, uh, our Sansi High School Bulldog basketball team, the 126 Expo, uh, won a championship. And you can see some of the great players. There's Earl, there's Harry Nakamura, Joey Keda, Fred Nakamura, and uh, Ray Matsunaga. And uh, Sal Bergesi, again, as I tell you, uh, an Italian descent. And a lone Filipino. <laughs> <laughs> well, we formed long-lasting friendships. Here's uh, Earl and myself at the 150th anniversary parade. We played uh, some great basketball. It was only 65 years ago. <laughs> and Earl is still moving around there at Santo Market. Any, any, uh, anyone remember the Carl, Dr. and Mrs. Carl Moore in the uh, early 1930s? Well, our, my attachment to uh, Dr. Carl Moore is to Mrs. Carl Moore, who was the midwife to my mom in 1931. She helped my mom, as my mom described it, a very, very difficult birth. And Mrs. Carl Moore was there to help her through this uh, terrible birth. And uh, she signed here on the 23rd of November that I, that I was born alive. And not only, uh, she was her address as a uh, 598 North Fork, which was uh, later the Grand Oriente. It's now a Hungarian Korean restaurant. And not only did she help my mom, she helped Mrs. Uh, Arevalo, who was a, whose family lived at 168 Jackson. I think that's bamboo seven now. Um, he saw, uh, she helped Ms. Arevalo get the birth to her son Isidoro to a, a Revelo. Unfortunately, he passed away um, 84 years of age uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, before that, we had interviewed him for our, for our history project. <coughs> any, relation, any relatives of the Kawaharas here? I'd like to give uh, thanks to the Kawaharas because in the midst of the depression, when those jobs were hard to get, Mr. Kawahara owned a ranch, uh, I believe it was Kurtu uh, Jimmy Yamichi, that's over there near, uh, on First Street, the on Brokaw Road. Well, their house was located on First Street, and I remember it, my sisters and brothers remember it, because they played in that old house on First Street, uh, beyond uh, Brokaw Road, and it was a digital 
uh, house, a Victorian home. But fortunately, it was renovated, and it was, I think, believe it was my sister Elaine who discovered that the house was located here, and so we even took uh, pictures of it. it. It is reminiscent of what we remember, but it's all spruced up and I'm renovated. At that time, First Street was only a two-lane road uh, lined with trees. We formed many uh, friendships. Here's a good one that I had of uh, my sister Elaine, Rosie Ramos, and Betty Jean Inouye from the Inouye family. Anybody here from the Inouye family? Mm -hmm. None? All right. The term for them that I use here are those typically referred to us, uh, my generation, which would be equivalent to the Nisei. However, it can also refer to the Filipinos and Filipinas that uh, later became naturalized citizens. Um, this picture was taken in front of the Reverend Kalyao's Presbyterian Church on North 5th Street, um, facing the Fukushima Trucking Company uh, yard in the background. And this is, this is uh, the uh, current uh, state of the church. Uh, it's, all, it's all abandoned. We, um, the house is located at 681 North 1st Street. We had a house next to it, which has now disappeared in the Happy House parking lot. <laughs> it's, it's, where, it's now where it is. And in fact, um, after our house, there was a complete a uh, uh, field of just dirt and uh, uh, cactus. Well, here's our Sunday school at the time. <coughs> so you have to remember that this church was only a half a block north of the Buddhist church. And the, uh, you can see some of the characters here. Um, that I'll mention um, and, uh, later. But here's Ms. Kalyao and uh, the Reverend Kalyao. There's uh, my sister Elaine here, sitting way in the back row there. This is a cheap cute. Yeah. Here's my sister Helen, sitting way in the back row also. <clears throat> and uh, our good friend, Dorothy Quibbley. And, uh, and um, my brother in law, Rudy. And uh, this smart looking guy here. <laughs> well, one of the most popular women of, of our era was Pasita Tuktuk. She was very, very popular amongst all of the Filipinos of that, of gen that generation. And she was chosen to become Miss Philippines in the uh, Golden Gate Exposition of 1939. Just about everybody loved her. <laughs> Now, this is another picture of her, but one of the things that she did was sing God Bless America in this movie, uh, They Were Expendable, the, the 1948 movie starring John Wayne. Um, and uh, it's memorialized, uh, fortunately, through Kurt. There's a benchmarker in front of the Omagari Coloring restaurant, and you can see it uh, when, you, uh, when you get a chance. Uh, this is her uh, title. Every Pinoy that I know, I mean, a Pinoy is another word for Filipino. But every Pinoy I knew fell in love with her, including my Uncle Ben. And I'll show you my Uncle Ben. <laughs> <laughs> we had many activities, one of which was very important. That was the uh, Declaration of Independence for the uh, Filipinos, uh, for the Philippines. And they celebrated the Independence Day on the 4th of July, 1946. This was a promise by the United States government to uh, provide uh, the uh, independence of the Philippines once they're able to govern themselves. And so we celebrated this, and all of the uh, Pinais, uh, the very cute Pinais here, are wearing the uh, traditional Maria, Maria Clara formal ground. And these are some of the families, uh, the Tutus, which I'll mention later, Mrs. Villarros, Mrs. Trevinius, Mrs. Rax, Rax, and my mom. And Typical of the Filipinos at that time, we didn't know the names of the first, uh, the first names of the uh, older Filipinos because it was tradition to address them either as Mano, Banan, Uncle, or Auntie. And I don't know Mrs. Villiers' first name or Mrs. Camillo's first name. And I think this is Mercedes. Is that right, Mercedes? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, let me get into some of the things that uh, that uh, show the uh, business activities in the Philippines, in the uh, Sixth Street. The Filipino-owned stores were 
uh, uh, Sunness Variety Store and Bacosa's Uni uh, Universal Cafe. The landmark that you see here is a Kenjing Lo. Um, it's on the uh, west side of the uh, 6th Street. Uh, if we focus on uh, Kenjing Lo, you can see that um, they had a Philippine food mark. And I'll, I'll show a globe of that. Kenjing Lo was uh, located at 625. They were uh, that restaurant and wings was one of our favorite and a group of us would always go in there in order to the biggest bowl of noodle soup and get as many spoons as possible <laughs> <laughs> well when I mean, you used to be royce you didn't have much money at that time <laughs> jimmy ding was the owner of the kenny Lo, and he was supposedly the uh, unofficial mayor of the chinatown that we knew <laughs> but uh, some say it was charlie Moy, and uh, so i'm not uh, quite sure uh, which one it uh, actually is and uh, I should mention Larry Ning because of all of the Chinese uh, kids that we knew, Larry was very close to us through all of his years until his, uh, his passing. Here's a close-up of the food mart. Uh, the, uh, this is one of the Filipino stores, uh, Filipino-owned stores that was established under about 1940 after the war uh, in cooperation with uh, Jimmy Ning. And unfortunately, what's going to happen, as you know, is this, this building is for sale. And uh, if it is get sold, then any of the tradition that's associated with the building will disappear. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to prevent that by writing a little bit more about it. Uh, here's a close-up of now of the uh, east side of 6th Street, where we can see that uh, the Subness Variety Store and uh, the Universal Cafe. And I, you can't make this up here, but if you roll it up, yeah, I had a side of that, but I had to leave it. And you can see that it is a universal cafe and variety store. That's Subnet's Five and Dime and the, uh, the Universal Cafe. Now, I should mention that Ramon Quiblin, as far as we knew, owned and uh, operated a pool hall in this same building as Subnet. Uh, I believe it was in the early 30s. And of course, this is a uh, this may have been during the war years because there's a World War II service flag here. And if you, uh, I, I blew it up to identify it as a, a World War II service flag. There's, we don't have very many pictures of the businesses on the east side of uh, 6th Street because it is all the buildings on that side of the street are totally demolished. Completely all the way through to the uh, Chinese temple that used to sit on uh, 6th and Taylor. We identified the Toto's Filipino neighborhood grocery store. This is the old Japanese bathhouse. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. This building is, sits right at the northeast corner. And in between these two buildings is a barber shop. So we need a better picture of that. And this is what we have. Uh, through uh, a lot of research, and I think Ralph, you're the one who found this. Yeah, the, this is first year, Ralph. Um, the, the, the buildings were identified as Tut Tuts, uh, that's the uh, Singh's family, on uh, uh, the Grocery at 620, the Yamato Bath House, Kanoto's Barbershop, and the Diet uh, Grocery Store. Formerly, prior to the war, it was Kani Grocery Store before the interview. As a blow up of the Toto's Philippines neighborhood grocery and the Yamato bathhouse, just to show some detail. As far as I remember, in front of each of the stores was a wooden bench. Uh, most of the Filipino home stores had wooden benches in front of them, and you can see a couple of the, the locals sitting here. At the time, the uh, as we remember it, the Yamato bathhouse was uh, essentially deserted. It was not abandoned because it was still in good shape. There's the uh, barber shop and the uh, diet grocery store uh, uh, market. Now there's two parts of this that uh, I guess I should point out. There's the alleyway. Most of the buildings at that time had alleyways, and you could access Highlandville, Chinatown through there. And I remember very distinctly, and my sister used to remember this too, shopping, my mom, our mom, shopping in Highlandville. Now, the neat thing about Highlandville is that if you picture 
the Chinese of the old era with their curly hair, their uh, black beanie, and their black outfits. That's what you saw there at the time. And the streets were muddy, the old sidewalk, I believe, was wood. Uh, and all of the goods were out of uh, boxes out, laid out on the sidewalk. Almost like you would see in Grand Avenue in San Francisco. Let's see, oh, and uh, just to give you a perspective, this is uh, the railroad crossing, 7th Street. This is 6th, and Jackson is on the side here. Okay. This is, uh, I wanted to show you this one because prior to the Toto's Philippines neighborhood grocery, there was several businesses before them, and that was in uh, Kuguro's in about 1928, and uh, Ishikawa's about 1937, and finally the Toto's in 1943. And at that time, the Ise were able to own land before the passing of the uh, Alien Land Law in 1913, which prohibited that. <laughs> I wanted to show you this one because it's a, it's a good one that shows what happened to the access to the alleyways when the Hainan Bill um, uh, vanished and uh, most of the buildings were deserted, they uh, boarded up the alleyways so you couldn't get into them. But in the days, about 1920s, those alleys, some of the big alleys, actually had names and, the, and those streets went into uh, Heinlandville, which was uh, had a street called Cleveland Avenue at the time. An interesting part of this is that um, the, from 602 to 632, I believe, there was uh, all the uh, residences owned by Japanese uh, or um, uh, stores uh, operated by Japanese. And I call that the part of the start of the Nihonmachi of that era. And one more part here that's a little bit of like trying to do an investigation because we have very few pictures of the west side of the building. If you look in here, you see a reflection of uh, some buildings. Um, the little buildings on the west side. So I tried to blow it up. Well, I don't have the software that CSI does. So I just you know, went ahead anyway just to give you an idea that there were some buildings across the street that were owned by the Filipinos. And I, I'm guessing by the angle that it was the Escalante's pool hall, the brick building that's now occupied by Togura. And it should have had then at the time the pool hall, Chinese, Chinese grocery store, Rag my uncle's laundry, and a barber shop. But I don't remember what the name of the barber shop was. Anybody remember what that barber shop was? Me? Ben? I don't. No. It was a great place for the uh, for all of us to, uh, to gather. And so I got this picture that shows our uh, our second generation generation P9s uh, uh, gathering here for this picture. Uh, to orient you, there's a railroad crossing, Seventh Street. This this is um, Jackson. There's the water tower, uh, the, what we knew as then as the Del Monte water tower, that still exists. And here's a, a witness now called Mariani, and the California Pickle Factory. And that's distinctive because in those days, if you walk near the Pickle Factory, you can smell all the dill pickles. About that overwhelming, but delicious smell. But these are the, and these are the, some of the families that are owned the, own the stores, the Focosas. The Escalantes. And uh, this is their friend from uh, San Francisco, Tilly Durak, who is the cousin to the Arabellos. <coughs> this, this is our only tie to the era of that, uh, to that uh, first wave Filipino era. And that's the community center at uh, 635 North 5th, uh, 6th. In those days, the building was used for a whole lot of gambling. Um, card playing, I should say, and uh, for the older Filipinos. <laughs> In those days, they had unusual arrangements with the city, uh, which I guess were legacies from the 1920s and 30s, where law enforcement was a little more community oriented. <laughs> Fortunately for us, there was a group of uh, forward looking Filipinos that uh, got together to finance the purchase and building 
of the community center. <coughs> and here's what it looks at now. And the uh, the known founders are the uh, Peralta brothers, Max, Chin, and Tony, the Catolico brothers, Esteban and Mariano, Severino Rusty, very prominent in Grand Oriente, Valor Duanis, a barber, barber, Frank Bravo, another barber, Leo Escalante Sr., who is on the pool hall there in the corner of Six and Jackson, and Alex Fabros. <coughs> you should know this uh, building here. It's still standing. Everybody you know probably remembers it as Miss Yoga's. Well, this was built by Mr. Surapawa in the 1920s, and you can look at the building and it reflects the uh, architecture and art deco of that period. And over the years, it was used by uh, as residents and business by Japanese and Filipinos. And once the building was sold, unfortunately, its colorful past will be uh, will disappear. Although there is a bench marker in front that uh, you can see, and part of its colorful past is my uncle Ben, who worked for Mr. Surakawa in the 19, uh, early 30s. But because of the Depression time, the business was very, very difficult. So he sold out to my Uncle Ben. And he moved uh, later to 611 North 6th Street. If you go to that address, it'll say Sakamoto on it. There's a, you see, you can see the uh, uh, Japanese doll that Mr. Surakawa had put up here, and even uh, this pot. Everybody remember this, no, Nishioka's. There's a bench marker in front of this building also. With the decline of the uh, Chinatown in the late 50s, my Uncle Ben and his family moved to Watsonville. And the uh, business closed shortly after his passing in 1991. Uh, but what's sort of neat about this, if you think about it, is that what Mr. Sorokawa started in 1929, lived for over 60 years through my uncle, so I do laundry lived on for that period, even though he had sold it to my uncle. And uh, we have the memoirs of my uncle Ben, and he described working, that's how we found out about this, is that how he had worked with Mr. Surakawa and bought the, the uh, business. There's a close-up of the, of the um, dolls, and I like this because they're staring out from the past. And if you look at the, as, if you look closely, and as my uncle described it, it was more than just a laundry to Mr. Surakawa. It was like his connection to his homeland, and he decorated it that way. Well, if you looked at the the windows, it had another reflection in it. So I tried to expand it um, with uh, this poor software that I have, and it shows some buildings and some structures. And I'm guessing from the angle of the reflection that it may may show part of the early uh, uh, the Chinese temple that sat at the corner of Six and Taylor. I'm not sure, that's just a guess, uh, looking at the reflection and the way the picture was taken. One of the favorite gathering places was Escalante's pool hall. If you walk, this picture was taken near the entrance. If you walk in, there's pool tables, I think, believe there were four pool tables, I remember. There's a bar and uh, I think it was a uh, yeah, refreshments here. Way in the back on the left was the ping pong tables. And then just to the left of the entrance was a little nook where all the gambling took place. And uh, if you look real closely, you can see this is spells out D A D O, that's Speedy Dado, who was a Filipino flyweight champion in the early 30s. And uh, we all remember. Um, and my brother-in-law confirmed it, Rudy, that when you walk in, there's the boxing posters on the right side of the, of the building, uh, the uh, pool hall. This, uh, besides showing this very pretty night, um, this is the corner of Escalante's, Escalante's pool hall. If you look at that corner now, it's Kogoros and it has a window on it. But at that time, this post, this was used for a uh, posting notices. Well, inside, right at the corner, as I mentioned, when you walk in the, build, in the building on the left side, which is right here, was where the gambling took place. On the corner, and you turn around, on the top, there was an open window, and you could hear the Filipinos talking in 
will celebrate his 102nd birthday in November 2013. I went to his 100th birthday celebration, and it was magnificent. There, when you could see the lineage, because I asked what the lineage was, and there was like four or five generations. It was incredible. The three last brothers were from the same town, Pantok Nabakan de la Pasori. Mariano Catolico, of all the first wave Filipinos who were agricultural workers, had the guts and the initiative to apply to the University of California, Berkeley. And he was accepted and earned a BA in 1935 and a master's degree in 1937 in history. When we interviewed him, he said he was, he loved history. And his ideal was to teach history at some school someplace. And that was his burning desire. Well, if you were brown in 1930s, what chance do you have of teaching at any school? And so what happened was that he became a gardener for the city of uh, Palo Alto. In fact, all three became gardeners uh, for the city of Palo Alto, groundskeepers, I guess they call them, and they uh, all retired from the city. Well, sort of like a, a, yeah, a wrap up. There was a bustling organization of Filipinos, the stores, religious organizations. The mix that we lived in was Chinese, Japanese, and Filipinos, all first wave and second wave, or Issei, Issei, who were dominant at the time, and as I believe the uh, basis for the Nihon Manchi. As I show you, we had our formed our friendships very early through all the schools. Our relationships, however, were not, I don't believe, were a melting pot. Uh, now that's my personal opinion. There may have been. But we know of only one Filipino American Nisei uh, marriage. And, but to remind you, surrounding the Chinatown area, there were black, Italian, Mexican kids of our generation who I knew and some, a lot of us knew as very close friends. But when you put it all down, for us of that era, we are our second generations. <laughs> I like that. Okay, the Pinoy town vanishes because we grew older. And as we grew older, we married, went to school, or enlisted in the service, and there were nobody, uh, not, not very many who came behind us, both of the Filipino immigrants and those born here in the United States. And so it vanished and it, it deteriorated to the point where all the buildings that were on the east side of 6th Street were completely demolished. Okay, the, uh, there were other Filipino immigrants later, but the contrast is that from the first wave, we were all, they were all agricultural workers, very few professionals. Yeah, but now the later Filipino immigrants were mostly professionals or own businesses. And later, and, and, and they have formed uh, local commercial areas, but none like the Pinoy town, Chinatown that we knew. And of course, with very active groups like the Jackson Taylor Professional and Business Association, they supported development of what we now call Japantown. And when that occurred, it subsumed what was of the Pinoy Town Chinatown era. And what I showed you is just only a very small clip of what our history was at that time. Thank you. That was a really nice presentation, Robert. I really enjoyed that. Um, it really showed to me that there was this second generation. <laughs> and actually, that is, um, that is my theme, actually, that I'm going to be talking about of the Asian experience here in Santa Clara and its history. And it's from, I would say, uh, 1870 to 1946, okay. And um, so most of you know, um, at least the older ones here, that this was Valley of the Heart's Delight, right? And before it became Silicon Valley, it was the Garden of the World. 
And that tells you that this was mainly an agricultural area. And that was uh, the kind of work that, that the Asians did when they first came here. So um, the first Asian group were the Chinese to come to this area. And um, it was at a time when industrial farming was beginning and there was also family farms. But in these big industrial farms, meaning that they made a lot of uh, cash crop type um, vegetables and fruits, they needed more labor than what was needed uh, to uh, make um, to produce these vegetables. In other words, what they did was they uh, hired Chinese to work on these farms. And the kind of work that they did was called stoop labor. And stoop labor was one in which it was very intensive work. You had to pick up strawberries, vegetables on the ground, etc., and then uh, put them together in these crates. Okay? So um, when the Chinese came to work in Santa Clara Valley, uh, by the way, people know where Santa Clara Valley is. Uh, it's like north part is Palo Alto. I guess that's why, um, uh, you know, your father, or no, not your father, but your uncles. Yeah, my, yeah, my stepfather your and his friends. Stepfather yeah. and his friends, uh, you know, could work in Palo Alto. So that's the northern part. It goes all the way down here to Gilroy. Okay, so that's the Santa Clara Valley, and all of this was agriculture. And uh, the first ones were the Chinese, and they worked at the stoop labor, as I said, was those kinds of vegetables and fruits. And um, it was labor-intensive work. And the reason why uh, they needed that was because these were large farms, and they needed more labor to, to pick up these things. However, it was also racially um, um, circumscribed to the Chinese because they felt that because, you know, quote unquote, they're built low to the ground, they're small, their backs are shorter or something like that, uh, they could then pick up <coughs> those, those kinds of fruits and vegetables and uh, therefore, um, it wouldn't hurt them, but of course that's racially charged, right? Because Asians are human beings and we're all built the same way, which is your back hurts when, you <laughs> when you're picking things, right? So um, um, there was an exclusion movement, maybe some of you know, and uh, the Chinese were excluded in 1882, but they still needed labor in these fields in Santa Clara Valley. And so um, the Japanese came, all right? And they fulfilled the same role in agriculture as the Chinese before them, okay? So that was in the early period from 1880 to 1910. Um, in 1908, there was a gentleman's agreement between the Japanese government <coughs> and um, uh, the United States. And this is when uh, they allowed picture brides. Okay, so the Chinese, um, many of them don't know this, but m many, of, many of you don't know this, but uh, they, three quarters of them were already married. And it was a family strategy for them to go and uh, work here and then send money back to um, to their wives in China. And a lot of times they've called this bachelor community, but three quarters of them were married, okay? Uh, so the Japanese, okay, um, uh, some of them were sojourners who, who were not married, but by 1908, after that general's agreement, a picture bride system developed, and they were then able to marry uh, someone that's arranged marriage with the Japanese women 
in Japan. And so then families started to develop after 1910, and um, then uh, they wanted to make family farms, okay? And so many of them did, but again, it was those kinds of crops that were only deemed for the Asians, which is strawberries, berries, seed, uh, onions, okay? And of course, those are the ones that are labor intensive. You have to pick them off the ground and uh, you have to actually, uh, uh, it's like uh, when you go in your garden and you have to take out um, weeds, you know, constant tending, things like that. And so that's the jobs that the Japanese got. But then after 1910, they felt like, uh, we should move up in this world and uh, so many of them were able to do that and they became sharecroppers and tenant farmers um, so by 1920 37 percent of the population was women okay of the japanese population and there were 15,000 boys and girls under the age of 16. okay so as you could see, that generation, that the Nisei generation was coming of age already by 1920. But um, because of the, um, I guess, the alien land laws that uh, Robert spoke about, there were two of them. Um, these alien land laws uh, denied Asian immigrants from owning land and also leasing land no more than three years. So even though they had farming skills and they wanted to uh, own their own land, um, they still were able to, uh, sometimes they would be benevolent kind of uh, uh, white farmers who would allow them. I was just over there at Roy's. Um, and then there's Norma Neda's um, uh, history back there and it said, who's that family that allowed them to? Robert Peckham. Peckham, okay, so like, you know, they leased that land from him and then, um, then he then transferred it to his kids. And so what happened was is that in 1920, there was even more stringent alien land law. And so what that meant was they could not transfer their, <laughs> their, their um, uh, property to their children under the age of 21, because that was the only way that they could do it at the time. And so they, they closed the loophole. And so by 1920, they couldn't do that either. Uh, so um, it was a difficult time, but they still were able to persist and, um, and develop some family farms. And so probably some of them lived around here in the Japantown area, I'm not sure, but uh, the, I didn't get that far in terms of my research. Um, so Filipinos uh, came to the United States, the next Asian group, um, uh, after 1924, a large amount of them came, although they had been immigrating earlier since 1906 to Hawaii, and a lot of those folks who went there uh, wanted to work on the mainland. That's what they called this area. And so many of them ended up in Santa Clara Valley. And they were nationals, meaning American nationals, meaning that they could, uh, they had um, no restrictions in terms of in or out, you know, how you have to have papers today, um, you know, as a visa or whatever to enter a country. Well, they were. American nationals and so they were able to do that but they could not vote they could not uh, be in trials they could not you know be in juries you know so they were kind of like in this netherland of a status um, and um, what's unfortunate about the Filipinos who came after that time was that the Great Depression hit in 29 and 30 and so you could see from uh, Robert's um, uh, slides there that um, it, it was hard times for for a lot of people 
and but the Filipinos um, persisted and even though during the depression it was very hard economically there was still a lot of animosity that grew up around the depression because they were charged of those taking jobs away from white people okay and so uh, given that they were the first generation they didn't have any other people to ally with in terms of helping with their conditions and things like that so there was a union called the cannery agriculture workers industrial union which was openly allied with the communist party usa and so during that time period from 1933 to 1935 um, many of the Filipinos allied with that union and that union then um, uh, had spectacular organizing but there was a lot of repression against them and so um, they believed that these were industrial farms which I think they were and that you could organize them in an industrial way <laughs> meaning each uh, each crop as agricultural workers rather than craft workers and so many of the Filipinos joined that and they also made their own Filipino labor union in Watsonville and Salinas and they also fought for a decent wage and um, uh, um, better working conditions but um, most of those strikes, um, even though they uh, were very violent, um, sometimes they were able to get higher wages. Okay, so um, they were then kind of like, I guess, pushed aside uh, because you know people felt like, oh, these are radical uh, rabble rousers and. Um, but the Filipinos themselves um, didn't have other alliances that they could, you know, th there was no other generation uh, to work with in the Filipino community. They were the first. And they also believed in the American promise. They believed in American democracy and they believed in um, uh, the American dream that they could get it and the way they could get it was to to strike like the way other unions could you know so that was their their thinking um, uh, other unions that they uh, helped to form was the United Cannery Agricultural Packing and Allied Workers of America called Yucca Pawa and these were all CIO unions uh, Congress of Industrial uh, Unions, and uh, these, um, it's like a pre precursor to the AFL-CIO, um, these unions um, uh, also believed that these were industrial farms and that you could organize in cannery workers, agricultural workers, and other packing and allied workers. Okay, but none of them were Teamsters, though. The Teamsters were those who would bring um, the, um, the fruits and vegetables on trucks and bring them out, okay? They were all related to just uh, picking, picking those berries and vegetables and strawberries and things like that. So the other things that they did was, uh, I was, I'm so glad that Robert had that, um, was they formed their own uh, organizations, um, a Masonic one was Grand Oriente, and uh, the Arabolo family is is you know is one of the uh, major families in there, and then uh, it was Rusty, uh, what's his first name? Severino. Severino Rusty, and so I read all those. Um, I guess you could call them newspapers, although it's like only four pages. And so they would do this like every three to six months. I mean, come on, you guys. I mean, these are laborers, agriculture workers, yet they were able to organize and have these newspapers. 
So I'm, I'm trying to look back at this and how is it possible? Are all of them self-taught? How come they could write these stories in such an eloquent way? Well, in my research I found out that there were 14,000 students of this first generation that came into the United States. Okay, So they weren't all desperately poor who came to the United States. Some of these people already had some property and they had to pay their way to the United States, you know. And so some of those organizers in the union, some of those guys like maybe even Severino Rusty's family, maybe he came in as, you know, a student. I don't know. I have, you know, I haven't done those oral histories and a lot of these guys are dead already and, and I'm here and I became an academic only 10 years ago. So <laughs> I missed the boat, you know, so to speak. And um, even today, you know, there are very few students who want to know about this history because they think it's just, oh, that's just the past, you know. Um, but it's important for us to understand this. I guess this generation of Asians that came because really that they made this valley what it is today. Now, after the 40s, okay, after World War II, um, it started to become Silicon Valley. So that's what we know it as today. And um, the Asians <laughs> still work like the way, um, or I guess, Rugsack's family, you know, in the agricultural area and lived in the area locally. <coughs> But the second generation, some of them were able to get degrees. And even the first generation, some of them got degrees. But because of discrimination, both you know, against the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Filipino, they couldn't work any other places besides the agricultural area. You know, so the fact that Raksat is a, a <laughs> rocket scientist <laughs> really a rocket scientist. Yeah, I mean, he's for, for real a rocket scientist. You know how you will say, oh, that's not rocket science. Well, he's one of them. <laughs> but as you can see, the Asians grew up together during that time period, which was really very difficult. You know, I'm sure when you, when you look back, you'll, you look at happy times. And even if you did an oral history of your parents, they'll tell you the happy times. But there were also dark times, okay? And that's what history is about. We have to learn from what it was because otherwise the young people are not going to know what struggle is. They're not going to know what it takes to get from A to B because it's the the first generation and all of those others before you that made it possible for you to get to point B. So we have to honor that. And that is, you know, and that's everybody's history. This is really U.S. history, although I'm in Asian American studies. My degree was in history, mainstream history. But I said to, to them, I'm going to do Filipino history. And they said, oh, well, why don't you just go to ethnic studies? And I said, Filipino history is part of U.S. history. Uh, so I'm going to do that anyway. <laughs> so I defied them, and I did get my degree. But, you know, I came into it late. And I just wish that other young people, students, you know, will take this up. There's not very many. They all want to be engineers and rocket scientists. <laughs> but uh, it needs to be done. You know, and it's not just this thing you relegate to the side as ethnic history. No. We built this country. We're part of it. Robert was born here. You know? Right down the street. Right down the street. <laughs> you know? And that's the history and legacy of Asians in this area. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, before we go to questions, I've also been asked to, to uh, provide just a brief perspective as a representative of the Filipino American National Historical Society. And why, and I'm glad that you brought up uh, Asela and also Robert. I mean, I every time I see, I see Robert's, I've seen several times, right, it's like, but I, am, I find something new every time I see a version of a slideshow. And that's just Robert's experience. Can you imagine other Filipino Americans and just other communities here? If you were to tell in your PowerPoint, in, in a PowerPoint, in a visual presentation, how much history you would share with the community and the contribution to the impact your family made, you know, in a city. And, you know, so that, to, to, to kind of transition to that, that is why Fonz is around. Uh, I thank you so much, Tom, uh, and to the Japanese American Museum in San Jose for initiating this, because it's important for us to realize that all our communities are intertwined. And part of our story, the Filipino American story, here in San Jose, Japantown, is important because we need to see that all of us are on the same timeline. We all were facing the same struggles. But we all supported each other. And it's, it's interesting, I, I'm a San Francisco boy, a Hawaii boy, who was relocated here to San Jose eight years ago. And because I, I have you know, this, this passion for Filipino American history, I wanted to find out the history here of San Jose and Santa Clara Valley of Filipino Americans. And it was because of you know, Stella, Robert, uh, and many other folks here in this community that I, I found out how rich the Filipino American story is here in the Valley. And thank you so much also to Ralph and to Kurt uh, these folks are documenting history for everyone, whether it's the Filipino American experience, the Japanese American, Chinese American, Latino American experiences. And so what I want to share from my perspective in terms of now, uh, just to let you know, FONS, uh, Santa Clara Valley chapter, we're the newest uh, addition here in Japantown because we established an office in the Ise Memorial Building in April of this year, which is very significant. So we are now part of this community. And uh, I actually had spoken to, to Joe, uh, you know, um, probably a couple months ago, because I know you folks do tours of the Japantown area. And I said, does anybody include the, 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 the story of Filipino Americans? He goes, well, you know, no, not really, but we want to start doing it. And because I know Robert does his own tour. Now, we want to institutionalize that. And that's why Fonz, you know, and working jointly with Jan, but we could have, can you imagine just like the rich history of our communities, including Highlandville, when you do tours throughout Japantown, of people going like, I did not know that. That's amazing. And also the families who are, who are here represented. I just also want to, uh, you know, acknowledge uh, some of the families. I know the Ragsack family are here. Yep. Uh, some members of uh, uh, the uh, Regala. Um, Steve, uh, you, uh, you mentioned the Arevalo family several times. Steve Arevalo. In fact, there's Steve, uh, you know, his family. You can also talk to Steve in terms of, uh, you know, his family's experience here. But I, 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 I saw there's a lot of young folks here in the audience, and I want to uh, address this to you, because I saw a lot of people taking notes, a lot of them taking notes. <coughs> I hope that the experience here this afternoon went from, I have to be here so I can, like, get credit for my class. <laughs> and I know this, because I'm an educator. <laughs> to... Wow, I want to find out more about the histories of this community. Because that's how I got bit by the history bug. Okay? Early on as a, as a student, I thought history was boring until it took a history teacher in high school to make it exciting and relevant to me. So that is how I got involved in documenting Filipino American history. Uh, one of the things, and, and my involvement in fonts, one of the things that I'm doing research on is my mother, who was a doctor for over 30 years in San Francisco, who I didn't know when she passed away 10 years ago, was one of the pioneers of establishing the Philippine Medical Society of Northern California and the Philippine Medical Missions. I didn't know that as a child. You just watch your mom and she's going to work, you know, tending, you know, to people in, in the hospitals in her office. So a lot of us may not know our family's histories and the contributions we've made, to the fabric of the United States. And watching, you know, being part of the, the Japantown, I like to call J-Town community, a lot of people know that my satellite office is Roy's. Okay, that's, that's where I do some of my meetings and, and my networking. 
And it wouldn't. It wasn't until when I came here in, in 2000 uh, and uh, yeah, about seven years ago, uh, 2006, that I found out about Royce because I worked in San Francisco's Japantown for over 15 years. I needed to find another Japantown <laughs> when I moved to San Jose and found out the history about Royce and how that was a gas station where you hung out as a teen and several others. So uh, it's important for us to really document our histories. And now we got, oh, in terms of like the future of Japantown, I look around, if, if you've taken a walk around Jackson and stuff, I don't know if you've noticed, but there are several Filipino-American owned businesses. One is Kukui, which is owned by Orly. Another one has, and you know, they've got t-shirt. Another one is, I believe, uh, uh, Island uh, Paradise. Uh, around where, I think, was it, is it Soko Hardware? used to be, is now a Filipino-Hawaiian, uh, it's the Aloha store, which moved from Cupertino to San Jose, Japantown. And we have a new uh, you know, uh, t-shirt shop that just opened right over on 5th Street called Holloway, owned by Filipino-American Nathan and his wife. Okay? So we're seeing a cycle coming back here in terms of, of Filipino-American. I don't think it's even a cycle. We've always been a part of this community. But the next generation, maybe through osmosis, just know to gravitate over here. I also work very closely with Akbayan and San Jose State University. I can't tell you how many of the students I see always hanging around here in Japantown. And there's got to be a reason why. You know, they're, they're frequenting the businesses, they're hanging out at Roy's, whenever the festivals are happening here, they're major folks who come and contribute business. And, and livelihood and energy to Japantown. And many of our, uh, you know, next generation Filipino Americans are entrepreneurs. How many people know about the food trucks, you know, here in San Jose in the Bay Area? Okay, anybody know Ryan Sebastian? Ryan is the innovator of the, it used to be called San Jose Eats, and it's now called Movable Feast. Okay, he's the one who I like to think is the initiator of the food truck phenomenon here in the Bay Area and has gathered all the food trucks. So there's actually a, a food truck collaborative. A lot of them have like different locations in San Jose and South Bay and the General Bay Area where they set up. So it's not just food that they're providing, but they're also providing entertainment and culture. So you're seeing the new generation, okay, and how they're contributing to the livelihood here in San Jose's Japantown and the city of San Jose and Santa Clara Valley. So young people, I want you folks to, while you're taking the notes, okay, also, talk to some of the folks here who have established their, you know, history in the community. You got Steve Revlo, you got Robert Rocksack, there's a whole bunch of other folks here uh, also that you could speak with. Um, use this as a, a learning moment and, and find out the history. What we'd also like to do with Fonz, because this is one of the things now that we have a location here in Japantown, is we're going to be uh, moving towards, in the beginning of the new year, during, uh, doing some uh, monthly series at the Issei Memorial Building in the conference room. Uh, we will be collecting oral histories of Filipino Americans here in San Jose. So if you wish to have your story shared and told, please uh, pick up one of my cards. It's over there at the Farms table. And to find out more information about being a member of Farms, please do so. But we're going to start collecting history. We'll be working with Dr. Habal, with Robert, and um, all the other folks who are going to you know, be a part of this this, this uh, Filipino American World History Project. Uh, you know, Ralph and, and Kurt, you folks have already been working on like some other projects. So our hope is let's let's make this an even larger collaboration because we want to make sure to capture all the stories of uh, Filipino Americans, not just here in Japantown, but in the city of San Jose and Santa Clara Valley. So with that, I'd like to turn over to the audience for questions for the panelists. I'm sure you have several. <coughs> Okay, yes sir. If you could stand so we can hear. I'm Vernon Hayashida and I give a walking tour of Japan town. When I talked to you, I realized there was, a, there was a Filipino town here too and I want to get that involved in mine so If I could get Robert and some of the other old timers here to give me a walking tour, I would really love that. You beat that. Say, okay. say that one more time, Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I give a walking tour in Japan town and when I talk to Ron and found out there was a Filipino town here, I wanted to include that in my walking tour. So I'm asking if Robert and some of the older old timers could give me a walking tour of this area from the, from the Filipino aspect so I could include it in my tour. 
Sure. Thank you, Brian. Steve, we're ready to begin, though. Okay. I'm going to go to Mr. Steve O'Reilly over here first. Thank you, Brian. Um, just, just to add on a little bit with, with the Marlon Roberts said, um, if you look at the property on 4th and Jackson with the Korean restaurant, the ba Bamboo 7, at that Bamboo 7, my grandparents had their property there. Their house is still in, in existence yeah. on Coleman Avenue. They moved it to Coleman Avenue, 925 Coleman Avenue at Coleman and Heading there. But the significance <laughs> of that property was that the Grand Oriente Filipino owned that property for over 50 years. From 4th and Jackson all the way down to where Jimbo's was. Upstairs was the, the large house, or what we call the big house, upstairs where the, where the, where the Grand Oriente held their meetings. And underneath, they, they, they had the Bamboo 7, but it was before another Chinese restaurant there underneath. And then they built, right next where Jimbo's is, uh, a, a, a commercial space where they rented out to Normanetta for about 20 years. That, 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 that was his insurance company then. So that, and then underneath there was other, my mother had a beauty salon there. So that's a very significant piece of property that also should be included in the Japantown tour because they sold the property back in, in the 1980s. So, but that's very significant. And as, as Stella mentioned, uh, Severino Rusty, uh, uh, Rusty had no family. He had no family here whatsoever. He was a single man, came from Zamboanga, Philippines. Uh, he, at that time, uh, Rusty uh, worked uh, for the McCarthy family. How many people know the McCarthy family? Ever heard of the McCarthy family? They're the ones who owned McCarthy Ranch. Rusty worked for the McCarthy family until the day he died, he was getting a pension from them for $3,000 a month the McCarthy's were giving him. Uh, Rusty was a pillar of this community. And uh, anytime any Filipino got in trouble, they called Rusty to take care of it. Um, Rusty had also uh, went to the University of Santa Clara and got a law degree. He was, a, but he never practiced. He never practiced. Uh, uh, never practiced uh, law. He was a, a gardener for all his life. He became the Grand Master of the, of the Grand Oriente for over 30 years, uh, and he was a beloved leader. Uh, many of you remember, some of us remember Rusty, he had that one arm. Yep. He got in a car accident with my family. Uh, he got in a car accident going down to Alviso. And my uncle put, put, pulled, that, pulled the hat over his head. He lost sight and the car turned over and fell on his arm. <laughs> so that's how he lost his arm uh, back, in, back, in, uh, back in those days. That was Carlos. Yeah, Carlos, <laughs> he, 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 my uncle Carl pulled down his hat. But um, Rusty was, 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 he, was a, he was a visionary. If, if he had his way, he would have bought this whole block up. But unfortunately, you know, he won't, they stopped, you know, he would have bought this, this whole land. He had a vision of buying properties and all, but a lot of the guys didn't want to go that direction with him. So. But he was a very smart and visionary leader. Uh, we bought 20 acres down in Morgan Hill and we developed that into some of us with kids going down to Morgan Hill when we were kids. So, but uh, Rusty, he's a, he's a very few men like him. Uh, they own the, he bought the property in, Sa in South Park, in San Francisco now, South Park, right down the street from the Giant Stadium, AT&T. They own apartment buildings and a lot there. His vision was to build a, a big skyscraper there on the top. I don't know if that, that will ever happen. But he was a, a, a great man, a great man. Not many people knew, knew of him today. But he was a very, 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 very uh, good man. So again, I want to thank you for hosting this and, um, and the Japanese American Museum. Uh, and thank you, Madam Robert and Estella, for sharing the histories. Uh, this is Filipino American History Month. And um, we, we all uh, pay respect to that Steve? this month. Yes, sir. What about the Mr. Arevalo, chauffeur? Oh, my, my grandfather. My grandfather, Isidoro uh, Luna Arrivolo, uh, he came here in the 1920s. He's one of the very few Filipinos who didn't work in the fields. He, he was mainly a domestic helper, servant, chauffeur, cook. That, that was my grandfather. And uh, how many of you remember the Hart family in the 1929, 19, they were a very prominent family. They owned Hart department stores. 
The, the home is right where the YWCA over on the Alameda and um, Navy. And my grandfather worked for that family. And at that time, in, uh, I forgot, when was that? When was the kidnapping in 1930 what? 32, 33? Well, yeah, they had the kidnapping. Uh, Brookhart was kidnapped. And at that time, my grandfather was working for the family. Was kidnapped um, uh, from the hearts. And they found his body at the San Mateo Bridge. At that time, my dad was maybe about four or five years old when, when uh, Brookhart was kidnapped. But uh, it was a big day. I mean, the Hearts were, were the number one family in San Jose at that time. And uh, when they found the body, the baby, the, the young boy, they found, the, they found the kidnappers. And they brought him back here to San Jose. And the old uh, jailhouse was over there at St. James Park, right where the post office is at. That was the old jailhouse. And so um, um, what happened is the uh, a group of people <laughs> got together and uh, they broke into the jail, got the kidnappers, and strung them up at St. James Park. That was the last official hanging of, in California. They, they hung the two, the two, the two kidnappers. Uh, many of them uh, were prominent San Jose citizens who, who stormed the jail because the hearts were very well beloved and so they wanted justice. They, they, they took over. I think at that time the, the police chief was uh, Ray Blackmore. And so um, my grandfather worked for the family at the time. The family was devastated uh, because of the kidnapping. Um, my grandfather worked for various prominent families, mainly in the Alameda Navy Park area of San, uh, over there where, uh, where those big mansions were at the time. And the Hearts had the biggest uh, mansion on the Alameda Navy there. And so, uh, yeah, but that was uh, one little prominent time where my grandfather did work for the Hart family. And um, he, he, like I said, he was one of the very few who didn't work in the fields. Uh, and didn't uh, work in the, you know, go around throughout California. He raised his four sons here, him and my grandmother, like I said, right on Fort and Jackson. So is that the story you wanted me to tell, Robert? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you so much. And Jordan, you may want to talk to the team too, because, you know, he's got this great in terms of the tour of Japan Town. Okay. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks for being here. Yes. Well, my question concerns, uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, you had talked about the, the Filipino regiments that were formed during World War II. Yeah. Were those um, Ameri um, Filipinos that, were, that had come to America, or their second generation, um, those that were born there, here? There was, there was a, a mix, but mostly the uh, first wave. Uh, I know of several uh, of my generation, second generation, who were, who were the older ones at the time that joined the first and second Filipino regiments. Um, can you also talk about what happened um, with the Filipino community and the Japanese community um, when, inter when the order um, was issued for internment? Okay, well, I'll, I could give you a little bit of my perspective, and that was when I went, um, on Monday, the 8th of December, all the Japanese kids were crying in the elementary school. It was really sad. Um, all, all of us experienced that. And sometimes when we go to the houses where we knew the Japanese families were, it's empty. They were gone. Well, there's one good episode that I could give you that that, um, that was related to me by uh, uh, Tak Fukuda. I don't know if anybody remember him. <coughs> Fukuda was a uh, barber over here on Jackson Street, lived in Salinas. Uh, when he came, uh, uh, Jack, uh, Tak was a member of the 442nd. When he came back from uh, uh, duty, he was my barber, so we would see, sit there and talk. And I, I'd ask him what he did in the war, and like most veterans, he wouldn't mention anything except for the, how he got a Luger pistol. And, but I won't go into that. I don't think he would want anybody to hear that. But there was another episode. When he was in Salinas, right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, several white men jumped uh, Filipinos thinking they were Japanese. And there was a big fight. And ironically, uh, Tak and his buddies, which were all Nisei, jumped in and rescued these Filipino boys. As uh, I was sort of ironic. Uh, the, 
I'm sure that if you talk, talk to Issei Nisei about what happened when they were ordered out of the to, to camp, it's, a, it's terrifying. Because when we remember, my sisters and I, my brother, all of our friends, all the Nisei, disappeared. I mean, they just disappeared. Where'd they go? Well, we didn't know. We were just in elementary school at the time. But I remember on the playground, a lot of the other kids were jumping on the Japanese kids who, who, who weren't moved, who didn't make the first uh, internment. And so that was a very dark day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think, uh, uh, not to clarify, but you know, I'm old enough to know, uh, I think uh, like the first generation in the Philippines would come over here, work for my dad in the mid 20s, uh, 20. The, 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 the building over there was named after him, Tony. Uh, uh, it's a cake. It's a cake. Him and his brother was the first, they, they just must have got off the boat and came to work for my dad in the mid 20s. And they went all the way through, through the depression years and so forth. We struggled together and then the work broke out. But in the meantime, like you people think, well, the Filipinos are workers, so that's it. Just put them in a working bug house and you cook your own food, this and that. We live together with them. You know, they have to take a bath, right? And then a hard day's work. And they like to eat something different. Anyway, just like us, we, the old fashioned Japanese way, we had food off. Well, we had we wash this off on the outside. We go in back to warm up and get out. And when we get done, we call the Filipino. We always call them boys because they're youngsters. They're 16 years old, yeah. so we do a full day's work, and they take their bath with our bath. You know, the different things that they want to ride to town because they're <coughs> without the wheels. We take them to town, pick them up, bring them back home. All those things there, we worked together in Santa Clara Valley. I don't know about elsewhere. So we got on very well. I think uh, we mounted very good. And in any function, we never excluded. But now you're talking about the, the Filipinos uh, after when the war broke out. Majority of them was working for Japanese farmers. They were all farm workers. Many, many of them made lots of money. That's where Rusty got all that money in his hand from the fellow, one of the richest Filipino farmer, was on first in, in uh, Trimble Road. He was the greatest salary raiser around here. He learned it from the farmers and raised salary. I think he had several hundred acres there. You know, the other people took over, like our farm, Italian farm took over. But Tony was already was farming himself, so he was way ahead of the, the bunch. So there's a feeling like that, that uh, like discrimination. I don't know where they bought their suits, but like us, we could never go downtown buy a pair of suits to kick you right out of the potatoes. They wouldn't even look at you. Same thing with the Filipino boys. They were worse, they were worse, treated the worst thing we were. We were treated real badly as the Japanese. The Filipinos were really, they call them all kinds of names. So, you know, they had their struggles. I think you're, I'm, I'm going to be 91 next week, so I've gone through it. As a youngster, yes. So, you know, uh, they can't both for me saying that you know, they didn't work, they worked hard, they worked hard alongside of us. We had a hard time together, sure. But, you know, we put it together and we supported them. When we left, a lot of them said, come to my dad, said, what should I do here, what should I do there? Before we left, they all come by and ask them different questions. We were very uh, reasonable with them, give them all the information we give them. If same as other farmers, like their name is Kalhara Farm, the Ando Farm, you name them all, they all had Filipino helps. And the same part of it, after the war, uh, there was no more Filipino available for farm labor work, like you say, they didn't want to do stoop labor. So uh, one Japanese farmer, Nam Namatsu, he went to Sonoma, uh, Sonoma, uh, uh, Samoa, uh, and brought them over 300 Samoans to do the work. Now, they're big guys. They're like Vern. <laughs> 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 bigger, bigger. 
<laughs> and he told Bas Kupler, hey, could you bend over? <laughs> but you know, they, we needed extra muscles, so he brought over 300. He had chartered the plane all over, about the boys over here on the farm. That's where the small ones are here in San Clara Valley from being brought over here, and they stayed here. But uh, we missed the Filipino workers, yes. I mean, they did, uh, we didn't farm after the war, we did very little farming, but I know the big farmers, they lost their health. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, uh, other questions? Jim, over here. Not really a question, but <laughs> just a little, just a little history. Uh, I'm Roy Rexek, I'm Robert's cousin, so I figure I gotta say something. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, years ago, back then, I know it's Japantown, but uh, I know a lot of Italians lived here too back then also, is that correct? Portuguese. 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 Yeah. Well, my grandparents live right across the street here, the house that's under construction right now. And uh, that's where my dad met my mom. So my dad lived in the boarding house right next door where he stayed when he worked the fields. So they kind of stuck around, got together. My grandfather didn't like my dad, but uh, <laughs> I mean, if it didn't happen, I wouldn't be here. So. <laughs> So I'm glad they fooled around a little bit, got together, and <laughs> so I'm just half Filipino, but uh, I'm all for you guys, man. <laughs> and thanks, Robert. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Eric. I'm a Rogala. My family knows the Arevalos and the Ratsex, my mom, that's my Uncle Robert. But um, my grandma had a house right across Santa Market on 6th Street. And she lived there for a long time. And she told me a story one time. She goes, you know my condo? I said, yeah, grandma. She goes, he used to rent a house. I mean, rent a room when he was going to San Jose State for my grandma. Um, and um, also, being a Filipino, my grandma was beside me. My grandpa was Pampanga and my and my my mom is Ilocana, so I'm all three. <laughs> but talking about uh, Filipinos working for the Japanese, um, my grandma worked in Palo Alto for the flowers, and she worked for the Japanese. And in Campbell, I don't know if you know it, but in Campbell, she was the only Filipino that had a, a flower farm right by Westmont High School, and it's two acres. She still has it, but she grew flowers for, I'd say, like 20 years. And a little side note, this is just part of the history, is in Campbell, <laughs> We used to raise fighting chickens <laughs> in the 80s. But that was part of the Filipino design. When, we were, when I was small, my uncle, he, said he was Ilocano, and he worked in my grandma's backyard in, in Campbell. Every Saturday and Sunday, he'd get the chickens that we'd go to Stockton, Napa, Pismo Beach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking the 60s, 70s, and 80s where they used to fight chickens. But that was. The, the owners of the farms would let the Filipinos do it because that was what they did for their pastime. So every Saturday and Sunday, I'm a little boy and all these Filipinos are, and this is Stockton. Now, now and we're in some farmer's farm and they're fighting roosters in the back there. And so it's just a, it's just a little little uh, history, but yeah. Um, they're still doing it in Malaya. Oh. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> well, wait a minute, don't, 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 don't say too much because I'm uh, not you. I just happen to be a new song. Yeah, we have to do this. No problem. You just have to write to remain silent. Oh, and one last thing. My grandfather, Wilfred Rogallo, was a, a master sergeant in the first uh, Filipino. Regiment, U.S. Army, fought in World War II, so he, he was at Fort Ord, so he was one of the first to go to fight in, uh, in the Philippines, but for the U.S. Army. So. <laughs> Thank you. It's your story, okay? We want to talk with you and your family, as well as other families here, you know, to find out more, because we have to preserve this history so that the next generations know the valuable contributions that all our families made. Well, this gentleman tend to not come to you. My name is Ed, and I, this is a, uh, a little bit of operation, and 
If you, if, if, if you guys ever go to uh, Morro Bay, there's a plaque there, right before the big rock, and our, our farms did that. So if you come by San Luis Obispo, please come. Tell me and, and what, what chapter you're from. So it's a Santa, Santa Maria branch. No, no, no. Central California. I live in Santa Maria, though. <laughs> but I live in Fremont. <laughs> You know what? They're like family with them. Right. Everybody in San Luis family. They relate 90% of them are related to my wife. They're all Hapa. Mexican Filipinos. Mexipinos. Mexipinas. My daughter is Mexipina. I have a niece. She says she's Arapino. Arapino? Irish Filipino? Thank you, Ed. So yeah, I want to thank uh, you know our, our uh, chapters, our fellow chapters from Central uh, Central California chapter, right? That's uh, all fun. So thank you, folks, for being here as well. Uh, I'm gonna uh, have the mic to Mr. Ted. Hi, Ted. Hi, thanks, Ted. Um, how many have been raised in Silicon Valley, like me? <coughs> anybody? Any anybody remember way back when? Yeah. Well, my parents were um, farm workers that migrated in the in the late '50s. To the Silicon Valley because the electronic companies started to boom. And um, you know, I can remember where you know, the 49er Stadium was. That used to be all wild mustard fields. Yeah. It's something, you know, and now it's the Silicon Valley. But I think the reason why a lot of Filipinos were attracted to Japantown because of the grocery stores. Because we couldn't just get like um, an umpalaya or a bitter melon at, uh, at Safeway. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, when we would go shopping for groceries, we'd say, "Oh, we're going to go to Michiokas, or we're going to go to Santos." Or, I mean, that, that's that's what I remember growing up in this area. So um, that you know, that's just a little bit of my world history. Yeah. I was just wondering if anybody else uh, had anything to share about you know, have your parents the first, second Philippine infantry, and and uh, you know, raised in this area too. Mm -hmm. In, in, in regards to the 1st and 2nd Infantry, uh, today they have an American Legion chapter 714, Diestado Franco. Uh, he was one of the main organizers of the 1st and 2nd Infantry, and he was, a God, he was a godfather to one of my uncles. And he had, uh, we called him, you know, they called him Nino Franco. He had passed away in the 40s due to an illness. But yeah, he was one of the key, the key organizers of the 1st and 2nd Infantry. And they named the American Legion Post 714, the Diosdado Franco um, Legion here that's still active here today. So that's a little bit said about the 714. Yeah, my, my family is actually intermarried with Japanese too, from Hawaii. So um, you know, I'm just I'm just curious about uh, you know trying to connect with others that want to you know put together the history. And if anybody is is anybody doing anything about that? Because I remember we talked about. Yeah. Working on that book. Right. And actually, this uh, because Ted came in later. So what I had mentioned earlier, Ted is a member of two chapters, a Santa Clara Valley chapter funds and Vallejo chapter funds. One because he's a Santa Clara boy, and two because he lives in Vallejo now. <laughs> Let's do a cock fight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It has nothing to do with cock fighting. Now. I know you're off duty. Okay. But we had mentioned earlier, you know, when I made the introduction, that part of this, this conversation is also to identify folks who are willing to share their stories about, you know, being raised and growing up here in San Jose, in Santa Clara, you know, Valley, uh, and that's what we're going to work on. And that's what we had a hard time is trying to connect with others, trying to put together the stories. So, I, you know, that's another reason why I'm here. Anybody still interested in putting together the stories? That's the Filipino story of Santa Clara County? Is that Santa Clara County? Yeah, Santa Clara County. Yeah. 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 Uh, we talked about working on that. So one of the things, you know, if, if I can just like, you know, go off with Ted saying, so uh, many of the folks, you've seen the Arcadia books, right? Uh, Filipinos of, and then you name a city, Filipinos of Chicago, Filipinos in San Francisco. Uh, Arcadia, uh, Arcadia Publishing um, is one of the publishing companies that has really, of a Filipino-American, especially Fonz, has taken it, uh, you know, and, and benefited from because that is an avenue where we can share our stories. Um, you can, uh, if you look at Arcadia Publishing at their website, or actually if you go to any of the bookstores and uh, you look for uh, those books, and you know you can do a search the Filipinos in, you know Chicago, whatever the main city or valley is. We, I think, as as a community, have the most stories and most publications in Arcadia Publishing. So we were talking about having one of Filipinos in Santa Clara Valley. Okay, the 
the difference is that uh, through Kurt and uh, Ralph and, and myself and, and my, my peers, we're trying to put together a history of the first wave Filipinos in uh, Santa Clara County. However, Arca if you read the Arcadia books, there are pictures mm -hmm. and captions. Okay, what we're trying to do is something similar, but we want to tell a story. Right, more in depth. Which is, uh, which, uh, is a little bit more uh, personal, and, uh, and through that, we want to show how it relates to other Filipinos as part of their story. So we're trying to weave a, a larger picture uh, rather than just show pictures or photographs and captions. Right. So that's, that's the, what we're uh, aiming for. Right. We just go because I think the more books and publications we have out there, the more opportunities there are for us to share our stories. So as you said, I mean, Arcadia, it's very simple. It's more of like a pictorial essay right. of people's histories in the, and they also like focus on other things, not just communities. But it is, you know, for a, uh, an introduction, it's a, it's a good way for people to see visually uh, the history of various communities. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that you folks are working more in an in-depth uh, book that would detail that. That brings up another point that I always try, oh, I'm sorry, Ron? No, I just want to ask Ron. you a question. Are you talking about the books that say the Filipinos in San Francisco, Filipinos in Valeno? Yeah. The yes, those are, that's by Arcadia, Arcadia Publishing. Oh yeah, because I bought several of those books yes. already. Yeah. yeah, and most of, most of the authors are Fonz people. Yeah. Oh, so, they are? Yes. They are. The ones in Francisco. Yeah. Okay, uh, Robert, you had something to say before I go to another question. Go ahead. Okay. You. Um, is it Dr. Stell? Can you talk about the Filipinos and the Mexicans working together during the labor unions? I think that's a, a vital a vital story with the history of Cesar Chavez here in San Jose, but also um, with the Filipino and Mexican connection um, with, with labor in general. Yeah. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Because we, we tend to hear just, I tend to hear, I, um, I've heard through some of my own experiences about Philip Veracruz and his experience and then the UFW, but then it, his story kind of just dies off. Mm -hmm. And it'd be just nice to hear how they, the stories intersected and then what happened afterwards. Okay. Um, how, long, how detailed do you want? Well, and then you <laughs> Okay. It begins after 1924, okay, uh, because the Japanese then were excluded, and so they needed another group, big groupings of people. So the Filipinos were the next Asian group, and the Mexicans in the agricultural fields, and so they kind of grew up together, okay. Mm -hmm working in the fields together and that's why there's those intermarriages of Mexican and, and Filipinos, okay? But they also were racialized in the same way, you know, in other words, stoop labor, uh, probably one of the stories in the farm workers is about the hoe, you know, using a, the very short hoe and one of the things that they developed during the farm workers movement was a longer hoe so they don't have to stoop down <laughs> you know so uh, there is a long relationship between Mexicans and Filipinos beginning at around that time and then uh, Filipinos uh, because of the racist climate and of the trade unions also um, they developed their own unions, so Mexican Union, Filipino Union like that but then at critical times they would you know, become part of a coalition um, and, uh, you know, strike for better wages and better working conditions. And um, with the United Farm Workers story is that the Filipinos had already been organizing, you know, since the 30s with the Mexicans, really, all that whole time. And there were other times that they were even organizing with the Japanese, okay? Uh, but, um, by the time the United Farm Workers becomes UFW uh, of America, um, by that time, many of the Filipinos who were part of that earlier struggle did not join the UFW, okay? And the main leader, who was Larry Itliong, resigned in 1971, right 
at the time when they were going to make the UFW. In other words, they were part of the coalescing of the National Farm Workers Association and the uh, AWOG, which is Agriculture Workers Organizing Committee, and they, they became a Coalition United Farm Workers Organizing Committee. And in 1971, it became UFW. But by that time, what happened was is that Fili many of the Filipinos felt like they were being accommodated in the union 